Today you're going to find out uh, the seven greatest secrets I've ever learned about finances. And I think it's going to be really helpful to you. And I'm also going to give you a short test that will answer every question you have about why finances have been a struggle for you. It'll be simple enough that everyone can get it. And hopefully by the time we're done, you'll be on your way to financial freedom. I want to begin by giving you a test. Okay. And I know you're saying, oh, great. You know, we're already up early this morning. And now you want to give us a test. Nobody likes a test, but you'll like this one. This is easy. And when you take this test, you will understand how finances work. Everyone, everyone in this room will understand. It'll be so simple. You'll go, I get it. Here it is. When I say to you um, words that we use in the English language about things that don't happen, there's a word for that. It's called contractions. Okay. Now, see if you understand what I'm talking about. When I say uh, the word wouldn't, what, what, what is that really saying? Somebody help me out. Would not. would not. Okay, it's something that would not happen. When I say couldn't, that's saying something that could, could not happen. When I say shouldn't, should not. Okay, you, you, you all get that. That's, that's very good. These are things that, contractions, these are things that will not happen. Well, let's try a couple more. How about the word can't? Cannot, Cannot happen. What about didn't? <laughs> Did not happen. All right, now this is a little tricky one, so be careful. What about won't? Will, will not happen. Okay, so you understand contractions. You understand things that will not happen. And when we use those words, we're talking about things that will not happen. Now, I want to show you another one. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that no one in this room before this morning has thought of this as a contraction. But it is definitely a contraction. And by understanding this contraction, you will understand finances. <clears throat> Did you know that's a contraction? Now, let, let, let me show you here. I'll help you out a little bit. Does that help? In fact, let me make it a little, uh, let me make it a little easier for you, all right? <clears throat> Here's really the way you ought to spell it. <clears throat> Understand that? Okay, now here, here's the deal. If, if you're making a pay me not to anyone, you're helping other people get rich and not yourself. Have you understood, ever understood the phenomenon that you work more but have less? You know why? Because you're making pay me nots. Now, maybe a car pay me not, or a house pay me not, or a student loan pay me not, or a credit card pay me not, or a JCPenney pay me not, or a Kohl's pay me not. If you're making payments anywhere, that's why you're not getting wealthy. That's why you never get ahead. And, you know, we go to a car dealership and we want to get a car. And when people walk in, what do they say? Well, I, need, I really need to keep my pay me not at $285 a month. Now, nobody says, pay me not. They say, payment. But it's a contraction. And that's why your finances are getting smaller. Same thing happens in a church. You know, if a church has a whole bunch of pay me nots, I, you know, I know of churches, even here in our area, who uh, rather than buy anything or pay cash for it, they lease everything or they uh, rent everything and, and they never get ahead. They say, well, that lets us stay on the cutting edge of all the technology. But the problem is they're making pay me nots. Now, here's the great part about it. I wish I could, uh, and I hope this will erase. But if I was to say to you, when you look at English words that end with NG, what does NG mean? Uh, con continuous action. For, for example, if I say, ah, uh, what was that? Is that singing? No, that's making a fool of yourself publicly, right? Okay. <laughs> but singing means continuous action. A running means continuous action. It's something you do that, that is continuous. So what if we put this on here? If we're saving, what are we doing? Who is the beneficiary of this continuous action? You see who's in the middle? I, I, I know you didn't think you were coming to English class, but it's pretty instructive, right? Or how about this one? Let's try another NG area uh, uh, word. How about the word invest? If I invest, who's the recipient of all that? That continuous action. Now let me ask the question. Would you rather be making pay me nots or would you rather be saving and investing? So see, it's all a matter of what you want to do with your finances. You have to get to the place where you're making the right decisions about your finances. And see, here, here's the point. If you get rid of your pay me nots 
and you're saving and you're investing, it doesn't matter what you're paid. You can get wealthy. In fact, really, this is going to shock some of you. You don't need another raise the rest of your life to be wealthy. It's not a matter of what you make. It's what you make with what you do. So what I want to do, I want to give you a theological basis for finances, and then I want to give you a, a, a practical basis for finances. For, for, for a better description of that, what I want to do is I want to give you a foundation. And what did Jesus say? The man who builds his house upon the rock withstands the storms. The one who builds his house upon the sands doesn't. So we're going to build our house upon the rock. What's the rock? The Word of God. So I want to give you a theological foundation, and then we're going to go to, we're going to build a house on top of that. We're going to give you some practical things, and if you do them, uh, you can become financially free, like anybody else. It's not reserved for just a small group of people or some ultra-smart folks who figured out a way to cheat the system. No, here's the system. It's God's system. And if you follow God's principles, they'll work for you just like they do for anyone else. So, so here's number one. Here, here's the first principle you've got to get. Your understanding of where it all comes from will either keep it coming or cut it all off. Your understanding of where it all comes from, we're talking about money, it will, will either keep it coming or cut it, cut it all off. See, here's the deal. We have to answer the question, who owns my stuff? Now, here, here, here's the deal. If, if you and I own our stuff, we can do anything we want with it, right? But what if it belongs to someone else? I uh, spoke this weekend up in Ohio for a church, and when I got my rental car, first thing I do when I get a rental car, I, I, I walk all the way around the rental car. What am I looking for? I'm looking for door dings. I'm looking for scratches. I'm looking for dents. I'm looking for anything out of the ordinary. Why? Because I'm responsible for that car. It's not mine. I have to make sure I take care of it. When I bring it back, I make sure. I mean, I look at that thing. I want to make sure I'm taking it back right. Because I'm responsible for that car. It's someone else's car. I, I have a car here that I drove up uh, this morning when I came uh, to our campus. And by the way, that's someone else's car too. It's not mine. I really take care of it. People that know me. I've, I've, had, I've had over 10 offers for my car right now. It's a 2005 Toyota Camry. Why do people want this old used car? Because it's in mint condition. Why? I take care of it. It's someone else's. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. And see, this is not just some motto that we say. This is not just some, some oh, God, yeah, it all belongs to you. And then we go out and get in our car, go to our house, go to our business, go do our stuff. You literally have to get the place where you realize it all belongs to God. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in it belongs to God. And if we don't get that, we'll cut ourselves off from where it all comes from. It all comes from God. In fact, there's a great verse in the Bible, Proverbs 17, 16. It says, Of what use is money in the hands of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? Now, you want the Texas translation for that? <laughs> God's saying, Why in the world would I give you any more money when you've been acting like a fool with what I already gave you? And right there is the reason why God doesn't give many of us more is because we're foolish with what we already have. Here's number two. What you pursue will determine what you possess. What you pursue will determine what you possess. If, um, if, you want, if you're not happy with the possessions you have today, you have to change your pursuits. Uh, let me show you how this works. Uh, for instance, uh, several years ago, there was a young pastor in Texas who decided to get his family and his church out of debt. And guess who's out of debt today? Now I know you're going, oh, wow, man. It can't be that simple. Yeah, it is. Because what you pursue determines what you possess. By the way, if you like cheeseburgers and um, donuts and you like chocolate candy bars and, and, and you like pizza and you like uh, sugary sodas and all that, you possess that this morning. By the way, I like all five of those. But if you like being in shape and you like working out and, uh, and, and you like lifting weights and, and running and all that, you possess that this morning. You literally possess what you've been pursuing. And by the way, you don't have to tell anybody else. They already know. People can tell what has been the pursuit of your life by the possessions that you have. And, and you know, if, 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 if you're from a financial perspective, it doesn't look like you're very successful. All people have to know is, man, they've been pursuing the wrong stuff. So if you want to have different possessions, you change your pursuits. What does the Bible say? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first my Father's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember that? Jesus said, Don't chase after all that stuff like the pagans do. My Father's far more able to take care of you like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. He can take care of all that stuff. You don't need to do that. Just make my Father and His kingdom the number one pursuit of your life. All that will take care of itself. Now here, here's the deal. 
If you make God the absolute number one priority and His kingdom the number one priority of your life, you'll, you'll find how all that stuff becomes irrelevant. When you no longer care about money and make that the God you're going after, you'll have more than enough. But a lot of people say, well, no, you know, this is putting God first still. You know, I mean, you know, I want to go to church once a week and I'll pray every day and I'll have a quiet time and all that, but I mean, you know, I don't want to be fanatical about it. Why not? Why not? Jesus said, if you'll do that, all these things will be added unto you. What you pursue will determine what you possess. Here's number three. What you spend will always be more important than what you earn. What you spend will always be more important than what you earn. See, if you always spend more than what you make, you'll never make enough. Make enough. Everybody in this room, for the most part, is making more money now than we've ever made any time of our life. And yet some people say, well, yeah, but I've got more bills than I've ever had in my life. Well, you know why? Because you've chosen to have pay-me-nots. You know, you got a raise and so you thought, well, let's upgrade our car. Or you got a raise and you said, well, let's get a whole new wardrobe. Or you got a raise and you said, well, let's do some things around the house. Rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to discipline myself right now to go without some stuff, so on down the road I'll have some stuff. Now, several years ago, when we decided to get out of debt, I called our family together. We had a number of come to Jesus meetings. You know what those are, don't you? Yeah. Where you just come together and you're judgment day honest. And we had a number of come to Jesus meetings and we decided to do with cable TV and we even stopped watering our yard. Our yard turned to dirt. We didn't put up Christmas lights. We didn't buy magazines. We didn't go to lunch or dinner. We didn't go to movies. I mean, we shut the whole thing down. It was horrible. My whole family hated me. <laughs> it was terrible. And uh, I even had some staff members, this is years ago, and, and these two particular guys are no longer here, but my son, who's now our high school pastor here, was working as a janitor for our church. We like to start people out and find out if they have a servant's heart. And he did a good job. He was a janitor. One day he came, he knocked on the door, and I said, come in. And it was my son. He goes, hey, Dad, he said, I need to tell you something. He goes, do you know that some of your staff is making fun of you? I go, really? It's them. He goes, yeah, they say you're not living anymore. You don't go to lunch with anybody and you bring a sack of lunch to work and, 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 and you and mom, you just, you, you stop living and, and he said, they, they're really making fun of you. And I said, hey, here's the deal. We're going to keep doing what we're doing and the day will come and we'll make fun of them. And he got a big smile on his face. I said, no, we're never going to make fun of anybody else. But I said, we're doing right now what they're not doing so someday we can do what they can't do. And see, that's what you have to decide. Either See, I preached this series of messages back in, in uh, 1999 to my whole church. There was a handful of people that decided to get on the same boat that my wife and I, and they're out of debt today. But you know what the majority of the rest of the people did? And we've got a great church. We've got great people. But they heard the messages, and it went in this ear, and it came out the other, and they're still struggling financially. It depends on what you want to choose. But, but you have to get to the place where you say, man, I'm not going to spend all my money. Here's the deal. You, you can give yourself a raise right now this week. You say, great, what do I tell my boss? What do I tell the church? What do I tell the church planning organization? Nothing. Just don't spend all your money. Give yourself a raise this week. I have a game that I invented several years ago. I don't have my wallet with me this morning. But I always try to get to the next pay, payday without spending all my money. I do it every week. In fact, I looked at my wallet this morning. I'm getting ready to go on a mission trip to India uh, Sunday afternoon with uh, Doug Crozier. And I looked at my wallet this morning and I was stunned what was in there because I thought do I need to get some extra money to go to India I've already got extra money and I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten paid this week <coughs> just, it's just a little game I mean for instance how many of you have a, a refrigerator at home okay it's nearly 100% you don't go home and open the refrigerator and see all that food and say okay I'm gonna okay I'll eat all this I'll start on the top row I'll eat all this food nobody does that you say that's insane well why would you Spend all of your money just because your wallet's full of money. Spend less than what you earn because the principle is true. What you spend will always be more important than what you make. There's a great verse in Proverbs 13, 18. It says, He who ignores discipline comes to poverty and shame, but he who heeds correction is honored. So the choice is poverty, shame, honor. That's not a hard choice. What makes the difference? Discipline. Discipline yourself to do what others will not do. And by the way, the majority of people in this room are in full-time ministry. You know who the worst financial managers in the world are? Full-time ministry people. It's horrible. And, and we're the ones who teach this book about discipline. And we're the ones who teach this book about principles of, in every area of life. And yet so often we're the ones who really struggle the worst to, to live them. 
You know, it's tough to preach something that you're not doing. And I understand, like John MacArthur said, we're all preaching a standard we can't live up to. I understand that part of it. But it's a lot more fun when you can say, not only I've done this, but I do this. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And you can do that financially. Here's number four. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. But now really, seriously in this room, how many people do you know, don't raise your hand, but how many people do you really know that you would say, now they're really living the abundant life? And I'm not talking about guys like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or people like that. I'm talking about people that you know, rank and file people, even people in ministry. And I'm not talking about those in ministry who abuse the gospel as a means for getting rich. We all know those names. I won't even mention them. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about people who are really living the abundant life. By the way, you want to know how I define the abundant life? Having all your bills paid, having no debts, being able to do whatever you want at any time you want and to help anyone you want at any time. That's abundance. I mean, if someone comes up to you and says, in fact, I was in an airport, um, I forget how many months ago, it was in the spring, and there was a fellow, and we happened to be sitting to each other. And you, you know how when flights are delayed, how you kind of become friends with these people. It's kind of a weird phenomenon. And come to find out he's a missionary. And he was telling me, and, and not, not a part of our, our tribe, but that didn't matter. And he was telling me this whole story and, and told me where he'd been. He'd been in a little church. And, and he said, you know how people treat missionaries? And I said, no, 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 our church doesn't do that. And I told him what our church did for missionaries. And, and he's just sitting there going, well, how do I become a missionary of your church? You know, and... Uh, Anyway, he told me, he said that there was something in their home that had broken. I forget what it was. It wasn't a dishwasher, but something like that. And he said, uh, you know, we don't have the money to fix it. And I said, how much is it? He said, $300. So I pulled out three $100 bills and gave it to him. I said, now listen, don't go spend that for anything else, but go get that fixed. He goes, why, why in the world would you do that? And I said, well, you shared a need with me, and I felt compelled to give it to you. And he goes, well, I don't want to put a hardship on you. And I go, no, that's no hardship. Bless you. I never saw him again. I never got a thank you note. And that's not why I did it. But you know, that years ago when I couldn't do stuff like that, and you'd talk to someone, you know what I'd say to a guy like that? Well, hey, I'll, I'll pray for you. Do you know what James says about telling people, hey, we'll pray for you, go your way, and be fed, and all that? That's not the way we're supposed to live. So why not manage our finances in a way where we can do that kind of stuff? Live that abundant life. Well, what affects our abundance? Obedience. So you can't, you can't disobey God and expect God to bless you. That doesn't even work in the Cameron household. All three of our kids are grown now. Our oldest daughter is a school teacher in Fort Worth. Uh, my son is on our staff as our high school pastor. Our youngest daughter is a sophomore at Dallas Baptist University, training for ministry. But when those kids were home, if, if they didn't do what I asked them to do, you know what happened? They didn't get what they wanted to have. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, but when they did what I wanted them to do, and they went beyond what I asked them to do, you know what? They had access to everything I have and more. When, when they were doing what I wanted them to do as my children, I was trying to think of new ways I could do stuff for them. They never even dreamed. God does the same thing. Your obedience determines your abundance. Proverbs 3, 9, 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, you know how the average church member quotes that verse? Well, when my vats brim over and when my, my barns are full, then I'm really going to put God first. It doesn't work that way. You put God first, there you are at Matthew 6, again, your pursuits. You do what God wants you to do. And by the way, one of the reasons why I believe uh, I, I preach and teach and practice tithing is because God wants you to bring, the Bible says bring the tithe to the storehouse. You, you know what? He don't want you just to mail it in. You know why? He wants you in the storehouse. Why? Because you're going to be taught some other principles he wants you to know about. That's one of the reasons why we need to teach our people. They ought to be bringing that tithe to the storehouse. Why? Because there's other things he wants to teach us about marriage and raising our children and business principles and all the other stuff, relationships, and you could add to it. Here's number five. The discipline of saving will be more important than the amount you save. The discipline of saving will be more important than the amount you save. Now, I've had the privilege to be in about 120 churches in the last 10 years, and almost every time I speak, someone will come up and go, you know, I was with you until that number five, and I just don't agree with that. And I go, really, what part do you not agree with? They go, well, I, I think, you know, what good does it do if you're only putting in a, a dollar in savings? That's insane. I go, no, no, no. That's smart. Why? Well, because the discipline is more important than the amount. They go, no, I don't agree with that. And I said, well, your argument's not with me, it's with the Bible. 
They go, really? You got a verse for that? And I go, yeah, Proverbs 13, 11. It says, dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers it little by little makes it grow. I had a hero growing up when I was a kid in my home church in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I got to play on the church softball team. He was third base. I played short. And he was just a, an in-shape guy. And at the time, I thought he was a really old guy. He was probably in his 30s. But uh, he, uh, I got to play golf, go back to Muskogee, Oklahoma several years ago. He's now in heaven with the Lord. But we we're, we're playing golf. And I said to him one day, I said, how did you get in a place where you can play golf five days a week? You don't have to work anymore. And he goes, well, Barry, he said, uh, he said, I always put the Lord first, the best in my building. He said, my dad always taught me how to tithe since I was a little kid. He goes, I always gave first 10% to God. And he said, we kept putting money away. We, we practiced the 10, 10, 80 principle, 10% to God, 10% to ourselves and savings, 80% to live on. And he said, it just seemed like that never grew. And he said, then one day we looked and where did all this money come from? And he said, just, and, and that's when it hit me. It's the discipline. If we discipline ourselves, I tell people now with online bill paying, no one can use the excuse, well, I just can't save any money. Set it up where even if it's only $10 a week, goes into savings. $10 a week over years, $520. 10 years, $5,200. If I said to all of you this morning, uh, we have a stacks of $5,200 for each of you out here on this table when you walk out, there wouldn't be a person in the room go, I don't want that. No, we'd all take it. See, we love for people to give us stuff like that, but we don't give to ourselves, and it's that simple. Just a little bit of discipline. <laughs> By the way, Deuteronomy 8.18 is one of my favorite verses. It says, Remember the Lord thy God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms His covenant. God's the one who owns it all. God's the one who controls, controls it all. God's the one who determines how much you have. I mean, are you beginning to see a trend here? We need to do what God says when it comes to our finances. Here's number six. God will grow whatever you sow. God will grow whatever you sow. Now, we all know the Scriptures. Luke 6, 38, given it shall be given to you. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows that will he also reap. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We know all those verses. But somehow we think we can sow our own seeds and somehow get a different harvest. It doesn't work that way. God will grow whatever you sow. So if you're sowing stinginess and half-hearted commitment and partial surrender, which is no surrender at all, by the way. You don't partially surrender. You know, if you're in a war and the enemy says, well, I'll partially surrender, and they point the gun right at your head, I mean, there's no surrender at all. But there are tons of people, even in full-time ministry, who think they can do that some, kind, some way and still get a great harvest. You know, the old-timers used to say, you can't go out in the world and sow wild oats and then come to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. But that's what most people do. God's going to grow whatever you sow. So if you're sowing stinginess and, and, and withholding your best from God, God grows those seeds, even while you're here this morning. God's growing those seeds. You go, wait a minute, I, I don't want more of that bad stuff. Well, you've got to stop sowing that. You've got to sow good seeds. And if you sow good seeds, God begins to grow that. In fact, God doesn't just grow it, He multiplies it. That's just the way he is. Now, one more. Uh, number seven, sustained generosity will be the guarantee for your sustained financial success. Sustained generosity will be the guarantee for your sustained financial success. You can't be generous once in your life and expect God to bless you all of your life. That won't work. Now, that happens all the time. Someone will be in a church service, and they'll say, man, that message really moved me, and they'll write out a big check and put it in the offering. Like, okay, man, I'm in now. And then they're not even in church the next two weeks. Or they don't give for a month. That doesn't work. Sustained generosity is the guarantee for your sustained financial success. In fact, I believe the Bible teaches, and I've also experienced it just in my own personal life, that the more generous you are, the more you have. And in fact, the book of Proverbs says one man uh, gives and gains even more, another withholds unduly and comes to poverty. Now, I know that doesn't make any sense at all, in the world and even on paper but according to our God he says if you give more you'll have more and God's looking for people who'll be generous I, I believe one of the reasons why God's blessed our church in, in such financial uh, miraculous ways is because our church has been generous in everything we do every area of our ministry whatever we do and, and if I told you we just had an elders meeting last night and if I told you the numbers that are on our uh, financial sheet you, you'd be stunned Millions of dollars on deposit at the Solomon Foundation. 
for a new children's building. Almost $11 million right now, earning interest, to build a new building. We're going to build a new children's building. This building behind me is 150,000 square feet. The new children's building will be half that size, 75,000 square feet. When that one's built, we'll build one right out here, 75,000 square feet for you. And paying cash for both of them. How in the world can, well, you're a big church. No wonder you can do that. Listen, I came here 20 years ago with 188 people. And we had nothing. In fact, when we started our missions endowments, we have two and a half million dollars right now earning interest just for missionaries. Our goal is to get to 10 million. You know how we started? $500 a week. Back when we didn't have it. In fact, one of the elders said, can we take it out of your salary? I go, yeah, I'll do. I believe in it that strongly. We left the meeting that night. Al Dillon, who was one of the founders of our church, our chairman of the elders at the time, he goes, we're not going to take your salary. I go, Al, I'm serious. We need to do this. And now that initial $500 has grown to two and a half million dollars just for missionaries. Remember the discipline of savings, more important than the amount you save? And one day you look and you go, my goodness. Uh, our children's minister, Pam Siddle, begins her, her 21st year next week. We, she came in and met with the elders last night and they thanked her for 20 years and encouraged her. And I was sitting there and, and I looked at her and I thought, none of the men in this room were here 20 years ago. It was just Pam and I. She was our children's minister and myself. Very humble beginnings. But you know what we did? We, we started being generous from day one. And, and God has blessed that, and God has honored that. And you don't stop. You don't get to the place where you go, okay, we're there, we've arrived. No, no, it goes on and on and on. You, you let generosity become a part of your life. Now, I want to be very clear. Tithing is not generosity. That's obedience. Uh, some people say, well, you know, I, I don't tithe my money. I, I tithe my time, and I tithe, you know, my, my, my prayer life. And all that. Well, listen, did you know you ought to be tithing all that anyway? Leviticus 27, 30 says, a tithe of everything belongs to the Lord. But friend, listen, if you're not bringing a tithe, 10% of what God blesses you with, there are two things you need to know. Number one, you've cut yourself off from the supernatural provision of God. And nobody can help you with that. God says, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse, Malachi 3, uh, 8 to 12. I, I, I say, if I'm not throwing the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you won't have room enough for it. If you're not tithing, you've cut yourself off from His supernatural provision. He says, no matter what's happening in the economy, no matter what's happening in your world, I'll provide for your needs if you'll just bring the tithe. How hard is that? You get on the spout where all of God's blessings come out when you tithe. But secondly, He says He'll rebuke the devourer. You know who the devourer is? The person that Jesus talked about in John 10.10, 10, the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, here's what you need to know. Not only did you cut yourself off from supernatural provision, you cut yourself off from supernatural pro protection. If you're not tithing, everything you've got right now is exposed, and the devil can do whatever he wants to. He can cause your church to collapse. He can cause your, your, wherever your investments are to lose them all. You know, I've never understood that, how when you make investments and the, the broker or the person that you deal with, your financial advisor says, well, you know, we're all having trouble during the economy. Well, what happened to my money? Well, you know, we're all, we've all been hit hard. No, wait, you took my money. You're, you're exposed. So if you want supernatural provision, supernatural protection, you need to do what God says and tithe. But, but God said to the Israelites, you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. Those are two different things. An offering is where generosity comes in, where you learn to give above the tithe. You, you learn to do more than just obey God. You, you do more than is expected. Remember when I told you when my kids do more than I asked them to do, I, I, they had access to everything I had, and I was thinking of even more ways I could bless them? God does the same thing. So how do you be generous? You know how to be generous. You, you do things for people you never expect anything in return. When we got out of debt as a family, I told our family, we have some Christmas traditions. We like to watch uh, White Christmas with Bing Crosby and Danny Kay. I know it's kind of corny, but we do. We like to make Christmas cookies with our whole family. And, so we started a new family uh, tradition. I went to the bank, cashed a check for $1,000. I got $100 bills, folded them up, handed them out to the members of my family. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to our church's Christmas Eve service. I want you to ask the Lord to show you someone who could use a blessing. And then you just walk up to them and say, oh, I'm so glad I saw you. Somebody gave this to me and told me to tell you Merry Christmas. That's all you have to say. And, and we'll come back and we'll tell the stories. So our family did that, and it was an amazing experience. We came back that night, sitting with our own Christmas tree, hadn't opened a single gift at all, nothing, and we're all sitting there talking about the blessings and, and wiping away the tears of what it was like to just give away money to people. And we've done that for years. Now, that's a great way to get people in your church to come up and wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> and you have to use some discernment. I was at uh, Sonic Drive-In getting a drink a couple years ago. It was Christmas time, and... And uh, this really cute girl came to bring my 
Diet Coke. It was about 78, 88 cents. And she came to the door and, and I handed her a hundred dollar bill and told her Merry Christmas. And I took this drink and I was sitting in my console and I hear this noise and her hand is shaking against the coin thing. And I, and I go, is something wrong? She goes, I can't make change for this. I said, I didn't ask for change. Merry Christmas. She said, Bill, crocodile tears start coming in her face. And she walked in front of my car going, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> About that time I heard a car horn honk. I turned. My daughters had pulled into the stall next to me. Their window's coming down. They said, did you just give her a hundred bucks? I go, yeah, I did. <laughs> they go, well, give something to us. I said, I do. <laughs> I was at... Um, I was at home, we have a little home a theater where we have a screen and projector to watch football games. It's wonderful to watch uh, sports. And, and uh, I remember when my wife and I first got married, we had a little TV that was like this, that her dad had given to us. We thought we'd died and gone to heaven. We had this little TV. And, mm -hmm. and, um, but, but now we have this, big, this home theater. And so I, I was up there one night uh, a year ago uh, watching a football game, and I got hungry for pizza. And my whole family was out shopping somewhere. And, so I called my wife. I said, where do you get pizza at? She told me, I'd never gotten it there. And I said, well, I just want to get a small veggie lover's pizza. And anyway, she gave me the number. So I called and ordered this veggie lover's pizza. It'll be $9.97. Uh, it'd be ready in 15 minutes. I said, where are you located? They told me. And so I drove over to pick up my pizza. And when I walked in the door, there was a lady standing behind the counter like this. And then when I walked in the door, she gave me the dirtiest look like, and walked out, just disappeared. And I went, whoa, what was that about? Yeah. I figured it was a former church member. It wasn't, but. <laughs> and, about that time, a young guy came out, and he walked up the table, uh, the counter, and he said, can I help you? And I said, yes, sir, I, I, I'm Mr. Cameron. I'm here to pick up my, my uh, veggie lover's pizza. And he goes, yes, sir. And he pulls this thing out, and he goes, here he goes, sir. And he pulls a little ticket off, and I handed him a $100 bill. And I said, Merry Christmas. And I started to walk away. He goes, sir? I said, Merry Christmas. He goes, well, Merry Christmas to you, too. Come again soon, sir. <laughs> well, I got home, and I was eating pizza, watching this football game. <clears throat> and, you know, we've gone to a pretty tough a financial time, and I, I was sitting there eating this pizza. Do you ever have those beat yourself up conversations? And I was sitting there eating this pizza, and I, and I just, I don't know why. I said, God, is this a generosity deal? Is this, is this my deal, the giving away the $100 bills? It's like this. I've done that all over the country. I mean, I've been in a church and, and find out someone's a single mom, and so I'll, instead of me doing it, I'd just go get the pastor or somebody. Listen, can you give that to that lady? Oh, what for? I go, well, just give it to her. Just Don't tell her it came from me. Just give it to her. You know, just bless her. Uh, there have been pastors who, um, you know, I go to speak for them, and, and they think they're paying me, and I, I say, bring your whole family. I want to go to dinner. It's my treat. And they, and they don't even know how to deal with that because they don't have special speakers come to town to bless them or whatever. I, I've been with, with people where, where their kids are there, and, and without their parents seeing, hand a $100 bill to their kids. Say, put this in savings. Start saving. Just try to encourage people. And so I'm sitting there, and I go, God, is this, is this me or is this you? I mean, you know, we're in a recession, and maybe I should be doing this for my family and not be doing this anymore. Well, I just kind of forgot about it. It was on a Saturday. Came to church, preached on Sunday, three services. Went home that night. Monday morning, I'm up at the church, and I'm, 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 I'm in my office working. All of a sudden, there's a door at the, a knock at the door at the pastoral area where I'm at. And it's a security guy with a big, huge thing of mail. And I look out the window, I go, yes. He goes, you want the mail? I go, no, I don't go to the mail. Don't you put that in people's boxes or anything? And he goes, he goes, well, I thought maybe you might want it. I said, no, no, that's okay. So I go back and sit down at my desk. And I start working on something. I look out there, yes. He goes, he goes, you sure you don't want the mail? I go, okay, great, fine, thank you. So I went to the door, I got the mail, sat it on my assistant's desk, went back to my office, go back to work. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, maybe there's something in the mail. I'll just go look at it. So I open the mail and I'm going through all this kind of stuff. And there's an envelope in there. Uh, to me from Kaimishi, the Kaimishi Mountain Clinic. But any of you know where that is? It's a big men's thing in Oklahoma. And, all. and I'd spoken there like five, six years uh, previous. And so I opened this letter, and when I opened this letter, a check falls out. I'm going, what in the world? I start reading this letter. Dear Mr. Cameron, it is our understanding you spoke for us uh, six years ago, and we didn't cover any of your expenses. And we want to apologize for that. And we hope the enclosed check for $1,000 uh, covers those expenses and that you would consider coming back to speak with us again. Sincerely in Christ, uh, Gary Lane. Director of the Kaimishi uh, Clinic. And it was like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, No, this isn't your deal. Mm -hmm. This is mine. That check had been mailed four days before I bought that pizza. God wants to do way more than we ever dreamed if we'll just learn to follow His principles. But if we don't have the right foundation, we can't build anything upon it. Now let's talk about building upon that foundation. Let me give you some quick uh, things here before we take a break.
Uh, here's number one. I I I'll give you ten quick things you can do um, to be financially independent. Here's number one. Always spend less than you make every week. Make that a law. They used to have the, remember the law of the Medes and the Persians in, in world history? <coughs> Whenever they made a law, it couldn't be changed. Make it a law. <coughs> always spend less than you make every week. Number two, always put something in savings every week. When we were getting out of debt, people said, well, well which did you do first? Did you, did, you, did you pay your debts off and then save? Did you, did you pay your debts off and save and then tithe? Did you tithe and not save but pay your debts? And, and I said, no, we did all three. How in the world did you do all three? I said, well, number one, we tithe because we wanted God's wisdom and God's blessing. It didn't matter what else we did. We paid our debts off because we, we were tired of the pay me nots. And we put something in savings. There were some days when I only was able to put a dollar for a week in savings, but I did it. Remember the, what the Bible says, little by little you make it grow? There's something about knowing you've put something in savings. And, and, and again, if you can do it online where it just comes out of your, I mean, it's like your refrigerator. If my wife wants me to lose weight, there just aren't chips. There aren't Oreo cookies. There aren't, you know what I'm saying? They just aren't there. And after I eat a full dinner and I'm going, you know, I want something sweet. And she goes, well, apples and bananas, that's about all we got. You know, when it's not there, I don't eat it. How rocket science clear is that? So put money in savings every week. Here's number three. Never touch your retirement funds until you retire. And then only take what you need, not what you want. Never touch your retirement funds until you retire. And then only take what you need, not what you want. I know some of you are going, man, you know, Barry, this is great stuff, but I, I'm on a limited income. Listen, we're all on limited incomes. But you can get the unlimited blessing of God and the unlimited blessing of doing the right things, the principles that God has built into the universe. And, and it... No matter what age you are, you ought to be putting something in retirement. I had a gentleman, I pastored in Florida for 12 and a half years. He said, you need to open a, an IRA. I'd never heard of an IRA years ago. And he said, if you'll open an IRA, put in $40 a week. I don't have $40 a week. He goes, please promise me you'll begin to do it. What a life-changing decision that was. To do something I didn't think I could afford or couldn't do, but doing that all those years ago in Florida and now, well, the rest is history. Number four, develop an emergency fund. You need to have a personal emergency fund. We'll talk about church later. But, and you all do it in these increments. 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000. You say, where am I going to get all that money? <clears throat> you just keep contributing to it and watch what happens. Your ultimate goal is to have six months salary in your emergency fund. My wife's in a car wreck, a drunk hit her several years ago, demolished her van. We had to go buy a new van. We got a used van. They wanted $16,200 for it. We had $16,500 in our emergency fund. We paid cash for it. Now, we were a little nervous after we emptied our emergency fund for a few weeks there before we started building it back up, but we had built that emergency fund up over several years. We didn't know there was an accident coming, but listen, plan for a rainy day, because guess what? It is going to rain. Number five, once you have an emergency fund, you can begin funds for other things like a new car. New, new wardrobe, new vacation, whatever. But get that emergency fund. Here's number six. Never charge more than half your weekly paycheck on your credit card. Never. Why? So you can pay it off when it comes. By the way, I recommend you pay your bills every week rather than saving them up to the end of the month because we have a tendency of spending our money and getting to the end of the month and we have more bills than we have money and that's where our problems come from. Number seven. Never spend more than $300 without being in agreement with your mate on that purchase. Never spend more than $300 without being in agreement with your mate on that purchase. See, if my wife is out spending on the credit card today and I spend on the credit card today and neither one of us tell each other when the bill comes due, guess what? We're both surprised and we're both in trouble. If you're going to make a major purchase, say, hey, listen, I'm getting ready to do this. Is this okay? Number eight, use your credit card for air miles, but don't extend yourself Beyond number six, about never charging more than half your paycheck. Use your credit card for air miles. If, if an airline company or a credit card company wants to give you an air mile for purchase, that's just smart. I take my family on vacations all the time, and I'm able to get first class seats on an airline from air miles I've earned. That's just good business. That's just another way to, to do it well. Here's number nine. Budget for everything and stay within your budget. Most people don't budget for vacations, clothes, furniture, Christmas gifts. 
but those are things you better budget for if you want to handle them. Here's number 10, and I'll close with this. Celebrate your successes, but not with excesses. Celebrate your successes, but not with excesses. When you get out of debt, when you pay something off, don't go take a two-week trip to Acapulco and put it on your credit card to celebrate. That's insane. But you still need to celebrate. Every, every time you pass another milestone, you need to celebrate. You know why? Because what gets rewarded gets repeated. And if there isn't a reward to yourself or to your family, hey, we did this, you won't be able to make it to the next goal. But if you do, you will.